anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go anywhere he leads me in this world below. Anywhere without him, dearest joys would fade. Anywhere with Jesus, I am not afraid. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go.
Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege we have again to come in your presence and learn about the ways of the Lord. Lord, we having this important series de dealt with all these weeks. And Father, we pray again that you open our eyes of understanding today so we may see how you lead step by step. And as you lead, we pray that you grant us the understanding, the spiritual side, so that we'll be able to discern and recognize that you are leading us in Jesus' name. And as we know about your guidance and leading, we pray that you grant us the will, the commitment, and the grace to follow you through in Jesus' name. Help us so that we'll not be disobedient to your leading, so that we'll follow through on your guidance in Jesus' name. Speak to the hearts of everyone today. In Jesus' name we pray. We have been going through this special series of studies for some weeks now. And these are practical areas of life. You need to understand that there are a lot of people that study the Bible. There are some people that study the Bible in an abstract manner. They look at the literature, they look at the language, they look at the composition, they look at the life stories of the people in the Bible in those days, but they just study in the abstract. They never relate it to where we are living right now. And you find a lot of people that will even take examination, and they can tell you about a lot of things in the Bible. But the point is, they only study it in the classroom. They only study it like a lecture. They never make any application to their own lives. Other people study the Bible, and they get some moral lessons out of it. They do not know about eternal life. They do not know about transformation and change. All they can get out of it is the golden rule. Do unto others as you want others to do unto you. Beyond that, beyond moral principles, and taking a few examples from the lives of people they read in the Bible, they do not understand what eternal life means. The evangel within the Bible, the call within the Bible, the divine personality talking to people and calling people that they should come and follow. They do not know that. Other people go ahead and they study the Bible dispensationally. That is, they see many things that happen, but then they categorize them. Those things happened many years ago. But it was that their dispensation, their age, the time in which they lived. All those things cannot happen today because, you know, this is modern time. We can get saved on it because they believe that salvation is something that cuts across every age and every dispensation. But beyond getting saved, they do not know any other thing. They are waiting for the second coming of the Lord. When the Lord comes back, the rest of the Bible that has not been fulfilled in their lives will eventually be fulfilled. But a few people like us study the whole of the Bible. And we know that the Lord in the Bible calls all sinners. He wants everyone to repent. And in fact, you find out from the whole Bible, from the very beginning to the end, God calling man, where art thou? At the very time of the opening pages of the Old Testament. And in the closing chapter in the, Old, in the New Testament, you have, Let him that heareth come, and let others say, come. The Lord calling everybody at all times. And then after you are called, you are called to a life of following. There are particular things in the word of God that will do your life good. In taking decisions in life, in following the Lord, you read the whole Bible. Because every situation that can happen in your life, every event that can happen in your life, any difficulty you can have in your life, any problem you can have in your life, there is a solution in the Bible. Let's go right back to the time of God calling you. Look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He didn't say, anyone that wants to come, let him come. If they don't want to come, let them stay behind. He says, come unto me. Don't you labor? Aren't you heavy laden? And the problems of life too heavy for you to bear alone. And the confusion in life too confusing for you to go all alone. 
Are there not many roads and many possibilities and many diversions on your way? But I am the perfect guide. I am the captain of your salvation. I am the good shepherd. I am the good leader that can lead you from here to there without making a mistake. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And then he says, I will give you rest. And then the moment you just respond and say, yes, I will come. But I don't know whether he's going to receive me or not. Because I've done a lot of things that are bad. And I don't know whether my sins will be forgiven or not. As we are responding to the word of God. It says in John chapter 6. Verse 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Coming from the east or the west, from the north or the south, from the Jews or the Gentiles, from the illiterates and the literates, from the men and the women, anyone that comes to me, there is no reason for me to cast them out. For them I came to this world. For them I died on the cross of Calvary, asking that the Father will forgive them and bring them unto me. And as we begin to knock at the door of mercy, saying, yes, I want to come. And yes, I come, and I'm giving my life to the Lord now. Then the Lord receives you. But let me tell you what happens the moment the Lord receives you. Before you came to the Lord, picture your heart like a room. Picture in that room your heart, a chair, a throne. You were sitting there as the king, as the Lord, as the one that will determine and decide whatever you wanted to do, anytime you wanted to do it. But Jesus came in and said, Stand up from that chair. That's my place. You are usurping my authority. You are controlling your life. You are sitting on the chair on the throne of your life. That is the place that is meant for me. The moment you gave your life to the Lord Jesus, you know what you did? You stood up from that chair. You surrendered everything. You said, Jesus, sit down there. You are now the chairman. You are now the director. You are now the guide. And you are going to guide me through life. That's what the choir was thinking about. Step by step, he will guide me. He will lead me. Then he sits there. He is now the Lord. He is now the master. He is now the captain. He is now the director. He is the one that is leading you. What then do you do? In John chapter 8, verse 12. Then spake Jesus again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life. The moment you surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ like that, you begin to follow him. You are no more the captain of your soul, the master of your faith. You are no more the one directing yourself and saying, I will do what I like, whenever I like, however I like. You are no more sitting on that chair. It's now Christ sitting there as Lord, as King, as master, as ruler, as the one that is leading you. But then, how do you live? The Bible says that once you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ like that, you begin to walk in the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 18, but if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Notice three things that you now begin to do. Remember, you are no more just a natural person. You are now spiritual. Born of the flesh, you are flesh. With the flesh and self sitting on the throne. But now you are born of the Spirit, and therefore you are spirit, you are spiritual. And it's now Christ sitting on the throne of your heart. And because you are now spiritual, there is something you do. Verse 16, walk in the Spirit. Verse 18, be led of the Spirit. Verse 25, live in the Spirit. Three things, you live, you walk, you are led by the Spirit. You say, but I do not know how to be led of the Spirit. How do I discern that? How do I recognize that? Here is where Jesus comes in as a perfect example. Remember, he is sitting on the throne. Remember, he is altogether spiritual. Remember, he never did anything in the flesh, never did anything carnally, and he is the one, the spiritual one, the supernatural one, 
the great shepherd and the savior is the one sitting on the throne of your heart now and he always walked in the spirit and if you are now following the lord you are a child of god you are to follow after the master let me show you that every believer is expected to follow after the lord jesus christ in luke chapter 6 and verse 40 the disciple is not above his master but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master and if you are going to be as a master, you must check up when he lived his life here in this world. How did he live? Was he directed by God? Was he guided by God? Was he led of the Spirit? The answer is yes, every time. In fact, Jesus challenged the people that were professing that they belonged to him, that they were following him, and yet they were not obeying his word in verse 46. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? I'm leading the way. And as a shepherd, I'll be saying and teaching and talking to you about what you ought to do step by step. And if you say you are a child of God, a disciple of Christ, a follower of Christ, don't you know that means you must follow everything that I say? And in 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, He that says he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk even as he walked that is if you say you abide in christ you ought to walk even as christ walked how did he walk in the flesh never in the natural never in carnality never how did he walk then he walked in the spirit he lived in the spirit he was led of the spirit and if you say you abide in christ here is the assignment for you lifetime assignment what you are to do that you will walk in the spirit like christ walked live in the spirit like christ lived and follow after the lord and be led of the spirit like christ did let's check out some more how jesus lived his life in the practical sense in the day-to-day -day living, every time he spent on the face of the earth here, come back to the gospel according to St. John. Chapter 5, verse 19. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Doesn't that surprise you? That the Son of God, remember? He had been from all eternity. Remember? He had all knowledge. Remember? He had the abundance of the Spirit of God. In fact, we're told that the Spirit of God was poured upon him without measure. And yet he said, Do I have been the Son of God from all eternity? had no beginning, has no ending, and is the king, is the Lord. In fact, every knee shall bow at the mention of his name. Yet he said, as the son, I did nothing of myself, but what I saw the father do. That's how he walked in the spirit. He never said, this is what I will do. Whether the father agrees or not, I will do it. Whether the father is guiding and leading or not, I will do it. How are we to follow the Lord? Well, just like he did. That you do nothing of yourself. But what you see the Father leading you to do. Verse 30. I can of my own self do nothing. What? Jesus Christ? Who knew the Bible from cover to cover? What? Jesus Christ? Who had been with the Father from all eternity? Jesus Christ? Who was supernaturally born? Jesus Christ who was full of the Holy Ghost. Jesus Christ who was perfect and holy and sinless. And he said, I can of my own self do nothing. You know what? Immediately some people get saved. And they overcome temptation. And they're living right. And they're living holy. Oh, they say now, I don't need to be guided. I don't need to be led. I don't need to see guidance anymore. Look at me. Now I'm living a righteous life. Then they pray and they are sanctified. And after they are sanctified, the Adamic nature is uprooted. All the carnality and the original sin, everything uprooted. 
and all the propensity, all the tendency to evil, everything taken care of, and burnt away by the fire of God. Oh, they say, now that I'm saved and sanctified, do I need to be guided by anybody? Since now I'm internally innocent, now that I'm spiritually righteous, now that I know within me the experience of the uprooting of this Adamic nature, now I can do whatever I like because, you know, I can never make any mistake. Why do I have to pray? I have sanctified heart, sanctified common sense, and I have real understanding of the Bible. But look at Jesus Christ, holy and spotless and blameless and perfect and sinless. He said, I can of my own self do nothing. Some people, whenever they get baptized in the Holy Ghost, now they are saved, now they are sanctified, now they are baptized in the Holy Ghost. You know what they do? Now they say, well, I can rest. I don't have to pray too much now. Knowing the will of God, the leading of God is not automatic with me. Because I'm, I'm just speaking in tongues every time. And I have the power of the Holy Ghost. Why about the Lord Jesus Christ? As he came out of the water, the Spirit of God like a dove descended upon him. And the voice of God spoke from heaven, That's my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. And when John saw him, John said, The one that sent me baptizing in Jordan said unto me, Upon whom you see the Spirit coming, That is that, that is my only begotten son. And then the testimony is that, How Jesus was anointed of the Holy Ghost and power, And he went about doing good, Healing all that were oppressed of the devil, For God was with him, He was full of the Holy Ghost. Do you remember how he was born? The Holy Ghost will overshadow you. That's overshadow Mary. Do you remember that when he was baptized in water and he went to the wilderness, he was led of the Holy Ghost? Do you know that when he was coming back, he came back in the power of the Holy Ghost? Do you know when he cast out devils, I cast out devils by the Spirit of God? Do you know that every time he spoke, every time he acted, he acted by the Spirit of God? And yet, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the master and the teacher and the very son of God. He said, I can of my own self do nothing. I'll go beyond that. He did not only not listen to himself and he did everything by the father, not even by Joseph. Think about it. Joseph was a just man, a righteous man, but he wasn't even guided by Joseph. Not even by Mary. Mary was a virgin, but he didn't say well, Mother, what do you want me to do? Do you know what some people do? Oh, they say, I will listen to my father. I mean, the earthly father. And their father is not as just as Joseph. It's not as righteous as Joseph. But Jesus will not even go by what Joseph will say. And they will say, well, my mommy says I should do that. Say, yes, I'm born again. I'm a child of God. But I will go by what mommy said. But is your mommy as pure, as holy, as righteous as Mary the Virgin was? I don't think so. But look at Jesus Christ. Other people will say, I'll go by what my friends say. But look at Jesus Christ. He didn't go by what Peter said, by what John said, by what James said, by what Matthew said, only by what the Father said. He didn't go by what the Jews were saying. Other people who are Christians, they will say, well, I know what our tribe, what our village people, what they said. Jesus didn't go by the people of Nazareth, by the people of Capernaum, by the Jews. And he didn't go either, but other people will say, well, I've come over to Lagos, I've left our village. I know what the Lagosians are saying, what the Lagos city people are saying. Jesus didn't go by what the Gentiles were saying. And if we're children of God, and we're following Christ the Lord, and we have been born again, you know what we ought to follow? We ought to follow the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Look at that verse 30 again. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. As I hear, I decide. As I hear, I take action. Do you ever hear from the Father? Do you ever listen to the Father? Do you ever say, I can of my own self do nothing. This marriage, I cannot decide for myself. This new employment, I cannot decide for myself. This new decision, I cannot decide for myself. Many people who say they are born again, they depend on their mind. They depend on ideas. They depend upon opinions. They depend upon what friends are saying. They depend upon what relatives are saying. But Jesus said, of myself, I never take any decision. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. My decision is right. Because I seek not my own will. How every believer should begin to pray, Lord, make us like yourself. 
who have been saved, who have been sanctified, who have been baptized in the Holy Ghost. But then many times we go our own way, we speak our own word, we find our own pleasure, we do the things that will be convenient for us, but Lord, make us like yourself, that of our own self, we will do nothing and say nothing and act nothing and behave not in any way related to our own life. But it says, I seek not mine own will, neither the will of Joseph, neither the will of Mary, neither the will of my friends, neither the will of the Jews, neither the will of the Gentiles, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Look at John again. Chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. Can I say that? I do nothing of myself. Can you say that? I go nowhere on my own. I make no decision on my own. I do not act and behave and conduct myself on my own. Anything I want to do, can you say that? That since you are born again, since you knew the Lord, you have been following the Lord step by step, as he has been guiding, and you can say like Jesus, I do nothing. Under that, underline that word nothing. In your office, in your home, the words you say, the life you live, the way you dress, what you eat and what you drink, the places you go, the decisions you take, the places and the people you interact with. If you can say that as a child of God, saved, sanctified, baptized in the Holy Ghost, full of the Spirit of God, overflowing by the Spirit of God. Brothers and sisters, let me talk to you. There are people that, they pray. But have you prayed more than Jesus prayed? They say they are intimate with the Bible. Are you more intimate than Jesus was intimate with the Bible? Or they say, by now I have knowledge. Look, I've been coming to this Bible study now for more than one year. Let me tell you, Jesus was the Word personified. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. Jesus was saturated with Bible, with the Word of the living God. He was saturated with the voice of God, the Word of God, the written Word and the spoken Word. Every part you touch in Jesus, it was the Word. In his hand was the word, in his heart was the word, on his mouth was the word. He knew the word so much, he knew the letter, he knew the spirit, he knew the interpretation, he knew the application. And yet he said, I will not do anything by myself. What do we know? I've been coming to the Bible study now for one year, for two years. Because of that, we never find out the will of God. I can never make any mistake. How do you know? That's why the Lord has given us the example. And he said, look at me, the Son of God, the King, the Lord of glory. Look at me, the one that is the Word personified. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten Son of the Father. Full of grace and full of truth. The one that said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Not just that I know the truth. I am so saturated with the truth that the truth is me and I am the truth. And yet he said, he knew all the doctrine, he knew all the truth, he was saturated with the word of God, and yet he said, I do nothing of myself. What a challenge. What an example. For you to follow, for me to follow. Look at that verse 28 again. That I do nothing of myself, but as the Father has taught me, Jesus, the Father teaching you, Aren't you the word? Aren't you the truth? Isn't everything known to you? How can you condescend and confess that the Father teaches you? Oh yes, as the Father has taught me, I speak these things. That's an example for us. That the Jesus we are following, the Lord we are following, is the one that totally submitted and surrendered to the Lord, to the Father God in heaven to the point that he said everything that he did, everything that he thought, everything that he said was taught by the Father. And so when you are taking decisions in life, listen to the Lord, be taught by the Lord. That's what it means to be a believer. That you are following after the footsteps of Jesus Christ. And Jesus did everything by being taught by the Father, being guided by the Father, being led by the Spirit. In verse 29, and he that sent me is with me. 
the Father has not let me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Chapter 12 of John, verses 49 and 50. For I have not spoken of myself. Let me ask you. When you gave your answer, that is, yes, I will marry that person. Did you speak from him or from yourself? But look at Jesus. He said, I have not spoken of myself. In the day-to-day -day discussions and the day-to-day -day decisions of your life. And say, yes, I will go that way. Yes, I will not go that way. Yes, I will do this. Yes, I will not do that. Did you not speak of yourself? Did you hear any voice from the Lord? Were you guided by the Lord? Were you led by the Spirit of God? Aren't we every day, every moment, every time, just speaking of our own mind? But look at Christ, the one we are following. Look at Christ, the captain of our salvation. Look at Christ, the shepherd of the sheep. He said, I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment. What I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. I never check it off. I never turn it around. I never modify it. Once nothing is coming from the Father, I know it's to everlasting life. I know his life, his joy, his happiness, his glory. I know that it's going to be beneficial and profitable. Once the Father says it, I never question it. That's Jesus Christ. That should be the life of a Christian. The Christian is a follower of Christ, the disciple of Christ. I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. And already we have learned about the necessity of being guided by the Lord. And you've seen it today again, that if we are following Christ, we must be guided by him and led by him. And we have looked at some instances of spiritual guidance. Already we have looked at three instances of spiritual guidance. We have seen the voice of the indwelling Christ. Remember, you are no more sitting on that chair in your heart. You are no more sitting on that throne in your heart. You are no more the chairman, the director, the manager. So you cannot say, I will manage myself. No, you are not the manager. I will direct myself. No, you are not the director. I will lead myself anywhere I like I will go. No, you are not the leader. I will do whatever I like, anytime I like. No, you are no more the master. Now he is the master. And he's sitting on a throne. And you only ask him, Lord, what will you have me to do? Where will you have me to go? And anywhere, anywhere, fear, I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus, I can go to sleep. Anywhere with Jesus, it will be home and sweet home. And therefore, what I'm now... In what is now important to me and what I'm now checking up is that Lord, where is it? Anywhere. Just tell me. And so the voice of the indwelling Christ will talk. And then we have, thought, we have studied about spiritual intuitive perception. Just in your heart, in your spirit, you will know that thing that this is what the Lord is saying. Look at Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 27. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the bed of the belly. That is, your heart, your spirit, is a slate for the Lord to write upon. It's the candle of the Lord. You see, whenever there is darkness, you bring out the candle in those days, you light it, and then you are able to see your path, you are able to see your way. And when the Lord is going to light the candle in you, He lights the candle in your heart. But listen to me. The candle itself, without the light, will not give you direction. The candle itself, without striking the match and lighting that candle, that candle itself does not have light. It has the capacity to hold the light, to shine the light to show the light but then it doesn't have the light within itself but then the light will come from the lord upon the canvas of your heart upon the candle of your spirit and then the light will guide you and say that's the way to go that's the direction to go the spirit of man is the candle of the lord and so the lord will guide and we spoke about that spiritual intuitive perception 
And then also we spoke about the inner witness of the Spirit. The Spirit bade me go with them. And the Spirit said, three men are seeking you. Go with them, doubting nothing. And as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We know the things that are given us unto us by the Lord, by the Spirit which He has given unto us. I have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love Him. But God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit that He has given unto us that are we are led of the Spirit. So we talked about the inner witness of the Spirit. Now let's go ahead and talk about more instances of spiritual guidance. Spirit's confirmation of a series of events. And here is something that we need to note. Because you as a believer, you may not know that God can walk in this way. But you know sometimes He does. Some series of events will be taking place in your life that you will not know has any meaning at all. Eventually, the Lord will speak at the end of the series of events and bring the climax and the conclusion. And if you are not careful, you will miss what God is saying because you will say, ah, but that thing started two years ago and I didn't think that that would lead to this climax. I didn't know that that would lead to this conclusion. Look at what I'm talking about in Acts chapter 9. From verse 26, And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he had said to join himself to the, to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him, and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, coming in and going out at Jerusalem. Do you see that event? Barnabas did not have to pray and say, I want to know the will of God, whether I should bring Paul to these people. No, it happened so naturally, so innocently, without any plan, that they didn't know that the hand of God was in it. Saul had been converted on the way to Damascus. He got to Damascus and he started preaching the gospel that he opposed before. They wanted to persecute him and they wanted to kill him. Then they, threw, they, they, to, uh, they told him that now you must escape for your life. And they put him in a basket and eventually he escaped. He came to Jerusalem. The apostles were afraid of him. And they said, that's fake. That's counterfeit. He's trying to now get another way so he can destroy and scatter the people of God and Barnabas. Not that he prayed. We don't read of prayer here. Not that he knew anything of the ultimate will of God. Just because of the love of God. And because of the information he had heard, I heard that that man had preached in Damascus. So he said, I heard that he preached in Damascus. He is converted. Oh, Barnabas, you are sure? Oh, yes, I'm sure. They accepted him. Barnabas did not think of the ultimate, final will of God. He just did that innocently. Look at chapter 11. And from verse 22, Then the tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they should cleave unto the Lord, for he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added unto the Lord. There was revival going on in Antioch. And then Barnabas remembered this young man Saul. He had been converted. And before long, he had left Jerusalem. There wasn't any problem. That is, any personal spiritual problem on Saul. And where is he now? He's gone to Tarsus, his hometown. And Barnabas began to wonder, does he have proper fellowship there? Is he growing? Is he receiving enough talent there? He just remembered Saul. Not that he knew about the ultimate will of God, just remembered him. And said, I think I should seek for this Saul. And in verse 25, then departed Barnabas to Tarsus to, for to seek Saul. The Lord didn't tell him the number of, of Saul's house. The Lord did not tell him that's where to find. He wasn't doing this by revelation. Just the love of Christ. Just to follow up. 
just to help this man just to make sure that he's consolidated and affirmed and confirmed in the things of the Lord and he found him eventually verse 26 and when he had found him he brought him unto Antioch and it came to pass that the whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch then chapter 13 here comes the climax here comes the conclusion here comes the confirmation of the series of events that had been taking place chapter 13 verse 1 now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas named Paul and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of, the, of Cyrene and Manaim which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul at last and as the minister to the Lord and fasted the Holy Ghost said separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them Barnabas and Saul the Spirit of God now a confirmation of something that started long ago they didn't know that would be the climax you know sometimes it happens like that in marriage and when it happens everybody is confused when it happens everybody is opposed to it when it happens everybody rejects it that cannot be the voice of God that sister was converted and that brother was converted too but that brother had been in the fellowship for some time and then just heard about that sister getting converted in a particular place and just the love of God no marriage plan no marriage intention just sincere innocent love of God that wants that she to be affirmed and confirmed in the Lord and said sister you need to come to deeper like this just wonderful church when I got saved I just started there the Bible study enriched my life all the tracts, all the literature and the sister was just open to the Lord because she's just born again and so she came to deeper life and maybe eventually because of circumstances or education or work or whatever it is that sister went to another town maybe to, to study or to do anything and eventually this brother began to think no marriage plan no marriage thoughts just began to think and said is this that sister having enough fellowship now and eventually we'll find out the address of the sister no ulterior motive send cases buy this annotated reference bible buy chair reference bible buy Chris, any new book that comes out uh, in the church at the headquarters there will send to that sister and eventually years have come years have gone that sister has now come out of school that sister is now worshiping and even working somewhere she is praying about marriage the man is praying about marriage all of a sudden the spirit of god said well already you know your wife who is it lord is that other sister which sister the one i bought bible for the one i bought cassette for everybody will say i'm a false prophet it cannot be true oh lord tell me another name he prays and prays and prays no voice no name no direction no leading no guidance anymore oh lord can this be your will yes that's my will I've been ordering everything he can do it you have read it to you in the Bible and eventually the brother will pick up courage and will talk to that sister after going through the normal process short or long I'm not talking about the process today if you want to hear about the process you come another time today is just knowing the will of God and after you have known the will of God if you don't know the process you'll get into trouble with Zona leaders so if you don't want trouble come back next Monday and so going through all the process he went to the sister and said sister the will of God immediately the sister said a lie because of Bible you bought for me, because of cassette you bought for me, the sister went into the house and brought all the Bible and all the cassettes and all the books and said, have your Bible and cassette, no marriage. If that is what has now brought the will of God, bye bye. And the sister begins to pray, oh God, that liar came to me, that deceiver came to me, I've given him, I've taken my son, I've given him the Bible, I've given him the cassettes and all the literature. Now speak to me and let me know who I will marry. And the Lord replies and says, if you want to follow my leading and guidance, get those Bibles and everything back, that's your husband. Oh Lord, I will not do that. My prayer partner will tell me, um, will tell me that I've gone astray. The zona leader will not agree. Church members will not agree. And you lose your peace. 
and you lose joy. You read Bible, you cannot understand. You pray and there is no answer. You say, God, you knock at the door, the door is locked with padlock. You say, God, how is it? You say, okay, God, if you are the one talking, I agree. Then your peace will come back, your joy will come back. It will appear as if you are just born again for the first time. And then you'll be overflowing with joy. You read Bible, you understand. You pray and you are touching heaven. You say, I think I'm only depending on feeling. Then you say, God, I'm sorry. I, that man that gave me kisser, that followed me up, that did this, that did it, I will not agree. You lose the peace again. You lose the joy again. Even when you come to church and you hear a message, you hear the word of God, you cannot understand anything again. You try to pray, you cannot pray. You cry, you cannot cry. Eventually you say, Lord, I surrender. And when you surrender like that, eventually you, you find that this is a confirmation of a series of events that had been taking place for a long time and God is saying that's the will that he has for you. You see many, many people because they do not know that these things are in the Bible. They reject the mind of God. They reject the will of God. Another thing is that there is a spirit restraint in our spirit. That's another way that God will guide. The spirit restraint in our own spirit. In Acts chapter 16, I'm reading there from verse 6. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidding of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they are said to go to Bithynia, and the Spirit suffered them not. There are times that God will guide by closing a door. You have been praying and saying, God guide me, God guide me. Then in your mind, this is not the spirit of God now, but you thought it was the Lord. In your mind, you said, I think it's that brother. In your mind, you think, I think it's that sister. And while you are trying to go that direction, every door is closed. Then in your heart, there is a check. There is a pull. There is a restraint. There is a pain, sometimes almost literal. Then, listen to me now. Have you ever found when you lost a bunch of keys? You recognize that you lost the key. And you know that that's the key to get into that house. That's the key to get into that room. Because of that loss, there is an absence in your heart. It looks as if that key was inside your heart before. Now it is lost. There is an emptiness. There is a void. There is a vacant room there. Every time you are going, you know you just sense something is missing. And there is no joy and there is no peace anything you try to do your mind goes back to that thing that you lost even unconsciously and you are sorrowful you are sad because of that thing that you have lost have you had that experience before or sometimes you lose a friend and because of that loss the sense of that loss is built in your system in your heart in your spirit there is a vacant room there is a loss you have sustained. And that loss brings sorrow that you cannot explain. Anything you try to do, anywhere you try to go, there is a sense of loss. The same thing when you have taken a decision which is not according to the will of God. You might have even given your word. And you have spoken something. And that thing is not the will of God. All of a sudden, there is a sense, there is a feeling that overwhelms you as if you have lost something. There is a vacuum. There is an emptiness. And you are going about, you say, I feel empty. I feel there is some vacancy. I feel there is a loss. And it comes with sorrow. It comes with lack of joy. It comes with unrest. It comes with loss of peace. There is no peace. It appears there is a cloud all around you. It appears there is confusion. And sometimes you even cry. You don't know why you are crying. There is this deep sense of love that the Spirit of God restraining you, checking you, and telling you, you are taking that decision without me, I'm no more there, I'm no more present there, and I will not give you my light now because you see you've lost something. You've lost a bit of your fellowship with me. You are not backsliding, you are a child of God. That's why that condition is there. And eventually you go on your knees, you begin to check out, what did I do? When I was talking to someone, so did I exaggerate? The Spirit of God said, no, don't think about that. When I went to somewhere, did I take anything that doesn't belong to me? 
know the Spirit of God says, don't worry about that. I check my life, I'm living right, and I read my Bible that I used to enjoy, I cannot enjoy it. And everything is just like a vacuum. And then eventually, you think and you talk and you talk and you pray this way, you pray that way. You say, God, does that mean that this person I'm going, I'm thinking I'm going to marry, is not your will? Eventually, like just the light coming out in the early morning, the light will come. And you say, Lord, if that thing is not your will, I remove my hand. All of a sudden, you read the Bible, you begin to understand. You think it makes an impact. All of a sudden, there is joy in your heart. Your feet are light on the ground. It appears the Spirit of God overwhelms you, as if you are just born again today, today. And you say, Lord, does that mean that this thing is not your will? Oh God, if that is not your will, I remove my hand. You come to church, we sing in the congregational song, and the song touches your heart. The preacher is preaching, the preaching is touching your heart. Oh Lord, you say, God, I will follow you. After two weeks again, and the person said, uh, are you going to disappoint me? Don't you know I'm the one that you marry you? They say, well, what's all this confusion now? Okay, I accept. Maybe I was, I was just depending on another thing. Then you accept again. When you accept again, remember how the spirit guides, he restrains, he checks, he controls, he pulls, he draws you. When you accept again, everything goes blank. Darkness, cloud, vacuum, lack of understanding, lack of joy, lack of confidence. Everything just goes blank. If you're a house fellowship leader, you go to lead the house fellowship. You read everything on the outline. You read everything in the, in the Bible. Everything is empty. You are just telling yourself, speaking out words. But the words even don't have any meaning to you. The people too, they, they, they say, what's happening to sister so-and-so? She's been leading this house fellowship before and uh, dynamic, spiritual, flowing with the Spirit of God. Why is it that her words are dry today? Your throat is dry, your heart is empty, everything is just doing, uh, confused in your mind and in your head. Then you rush back home. Some people say, sister, I have a problem, I'll see you another time. You rush back home. You get on your knees and say, God, pardon me this time. I know what you are saying. That thing is not the will of God. I surrender all. All of a sudden, the light will come back again. The joy will come back. The peace will come back. And say, Lord, I will follow you till the end of my life. That's how God guides sometimes. But you see, people who don't know, they just go through all that. They don't know the meaning. They have that sense of loss. The loss of the peace and everything and the restraint. They do not know that this is what God is saying. Then there are times that God will guide by direct revelation. Look at Job. Job chapter 33. And I'm reading from verse 14. For God speaketh once, yea twice, yet man perceiveth it not in a dream. In a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, it slumbereth upon the bed. Then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instruction. Sometimes God uses dreams. Sometimes a plain, open, clear vision. Sometimes it's just another form of direct revelation. But listen to this. Anybody can be deceived by dreams. You know some people, the way they act, they do not see the way God has been guiding them in their lives. Remember I said before, to know the voice of God. You'll be listening to that voice before. Since you were born, you've been listening to mommy calling you. Now you're used to that voice. The same thing, if God is going to lead you in a major decision like marriage, through dreams. Check up in your life. Has he been guiding you through dreams before? Even when you are not thinking about marriage, you wanted to do something, and then God guided you through a dream. You wanted to do another thing, God guided you through a dream. Another thing again, God guided you through a dream. Then when it comes to marriage, you will know because you know you now have some experience. Otherwise, you may just get all confused. So for most of the people, he will be guiding them that way before. Let me just uh, remind you of the people that had dreams in the Bible. One of them, Joseph. Was it only one time? No, not at all. How many times? The number of times? From when he was young. The Lord started guiding him that way, guiding him that way. Eventually, when he got into the prison, and those two people had dreams, 
You see, already he knew that God had been guiding him that way before. It was easy for him to say, this is the interpretation, that's the interpretation. Eventually, Pharaoh had a dream himself. Again, they called him. You see, God had been using him like that. Do you remember Joseph in the New Testament also? That God had spoken to him when Mary was pregnant through dream. Eventually again, when, Pharaoh, when Herod was to persecute that child and was to kill that child, God spoke to him again through dream. When they were in Egypt and were to bring the child back, God spoke to him again through dream. You see, if you check up in your life, there will be ways that God had been leading you before and guiding you before. You've been gathering experience. You'll say, yes, I recognize that voice. I recognize that dream. I recognize that way. How God has been leading. But understand in the Bible days, God didn't guide everybody in the Bible through dream. Some of them he guided through dream. Some of them through these other things that we have been studying since last week. But he can still guide through dreams today. But make sure that it is coming from him. Check it out with all the other areas of guidance. Some people are always dreaming about sisters. They're living in Bagada zone. They dream about Bagada sisters. Then they go to Ajegunle. And then they dream about Ajegunle sisters. They have just secured new work at Ikeja. And when they now get to Ikeja and they are interacting with people at Ikeja, they dream about Ikeja sisters. Now which is which? Bagada Ajegunle or Ekeja. Because if it's of the Lord, it will be only one person. Because God is not going to give you a dream concerning three sisters, one here, one there, one in the other place. And so that's why we should check it out. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days. Says God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. It is still possible today because in the last days, that's the period between Pentecost and when Christ will come back. God can guide, and God does guide. Using dream or vision or revelation, but then you check it with the word of God, compare it with the word of God, to see if it agrees with the word of God. If it does not agree with the word of God, it's not coming from God. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 18. For I testify to every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away its part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So make sure that you compare whatever you are getting with the word of God. If it contradicts the word of God, it is not God. Then another way that God guides is through the divinely imparted love, unquenchable love. In fact, let me tell you this. You should be careful. You shouldn't marry anybody you don't love. You hear some people that will say, well, I'm going to marry so and so. I don't love her, but it's the will of God. Be careful of that. Or a woman will say, well, I'm going to marry uh, so-and-so, but uh, I know it's the will of God, but I'm finding it difficult to love him. Be very careful of that. The very center of marriage is love. And if that thing is the will of God, God will plant in your heart love. Now, it may so happen that you have not even been guided by all these other areas we are talking about. And there is a divinely imparted, unquenchable love in your heart for that individual. You don't know how it came about. You have not been talking together. You have not been exchanging gifts. And it is not a normal, natural affection. If it were to be natural, you wouldn't even pick that lady. Or you wouldn't even pick that man. This is just divinely imparted, unquenchable love. That this person that you have for this person. And if you have it for that person, God will walk at two ends of the line. As that love is in your heart, the love will be in the heart of the other fellow also. Look at the Song of Solomon chapter 8. Verse 6. Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is strong and as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. I'm not talking about jealousy. That's not love. Jealousy is cruel. 
You know, sometimes uh, you find a man and the other lady, and they're saying they want to get married, and the man is monitoring every move of that lady about, we come to church like this, he'll be watching her. And we finish uh, the fellowship, and the lady is talking to an area leader, a man, and after they finish, he went there and said, what are you talking with that man? Don't you know I love you? Don't you know you are going to marry me? What are, what are you discussing together? How about you know I'm a house fellowship leader and you know that that is area leader? Oh yes, but I don't want you to break my heart. And another time again, maybe they will come to church and this sister is, she has to see zonal leader. There's somebody in the zone that had a problem that needs to be discussed with the zone. And then she, he went to the zonal leader. And she went to the zonal leader. And the man is watching, looking at his wristwatch. And eventually, when they finished, we'll go to her again. I saw you. I saw you. You are breaking my heart. You are disturbing me. 20 minutes. I looked at the time. You were talking with that man. You call zonal leader, that man is my zonal leader. And because of the zone, you know I'm a worker in the zone. Oh yes, I don't want you to talk with anybody. Only pastor. No coordinator. No zonal leader. Nobody at all. Only pastor. That's the only one I trust. Because um, I love you and I'm jealous. That's a madman. I counsel you like your pastor. Don't marry a madman. I mean, anybody that will follow you about and monitor you about, that man is cruel. That's bondage. That's not love. But you know, love will deny yourself. You'll want to nourish that person. Take care of that person. That's genuine love. You'll want to deny yourself of anything and everything just for that person. And it is something that God just puts in your heart. And it says in verse 7, Many waters cannot quench love. Neither can the floods drown it. If a man will give all the substance of his soul for love, it would utterly be contained. You see, these are the various ways in which God will guide his own children. And he's still guiding his own children today. God has been teaching us all these things so that we'll not make any mistakes in our lives. And I pray that as we have learned all these things, they will become practical in our lives and God will save us from unnecessary costly mistakes in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and pray. Let's talk to the Lord in prayer. Let's thank Him for all these revelations. His word is clear. His word is plain. We need God's guidance in every area of our lives. You need the leading of the Lord. Surrender yourself completely to the Lord.
don't argue against his will. Believe the Lord, He will guide you. He will not forsake His own. Don't you know God loves you? He's been protecting you all along. He will not forsake you at this important time. Follow the Lord.